All right, a very special guest today, Eric Garris, the director of antiwar.com. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, let's see here. I've been reading antiwar.com since, what, I guess, uh, 1996, uh, or no, was it 98, 99, when uh, Bill Clinton started bombing Kosovo. Yeah, 99. And you guys apparently expanded quite a bit since then. Uh, why don't you kind of give us a brief description of what antiwar.com is about? What's the deal with you? Guys? Well, we actually started in 1995 during when Clinton started bombing Bosnia. And uh, but we really expanded uh, first at the end of '98 when Clinton started bombing Iraq uh, on a daily basis, and then uh, in '99 during the Kosovo War. Uh, we basically uh, are a group of people, libertarians, who have been anti-war for a long time and felt that foreign policy and opposition to imperialism is the, should be the primary focus of the fight for liberty. And one of the problems that we've had in working with the anti-war movement in previous incarnations was that they uh, basically wouldn't accept non-leftists. And this was a, a problem not so much for libertarians. I mean, certainly they, you know, don't, didn't get the participation in the anti-war movement, but also a problem for the anti-war movement in that they were keeping things small. And... We felt that the best way for the anti-war movement to succeed would be with a non-sectarian, single-focused, broad-based coalition. And that that is also consistent with libertarians and conservatives and, and non-leftists participating. And so it has, it, it, it has the benefit of bringing in other people to the anti-war movement, but it also has the benefit of actually creating an anti-war movement that can be effective. I read on the website that it's a branch of the Rudolph Born Foundation. Can you explain uh, the Rand this? Randolph oh, Born Randolph Foundation. Randolph Born, pardon me. Uh, can you explain to me uh, who Randolph Born is and what his well, foundation Rand is about? Randolph Born was uh, an anarchist, uh, anti-war activist, in the early 20th century, he was active in opposition to World War I. Um, he's actually also fairly well known because he was a crusader for disabled rights. He had uh, uh, some sort of degenerative nerve disease and was in a wheelchair, and he's also uh, held up for that reason as well. But uh, his, he wrote a, an essay, a long essay called The State, and it came, the quote, war is the health of the state, is basically the reason that we chose him as our identifying uh, uh, icon. And basically, the Randolph Bourne Institute was, was started by antiwar.com in order to have a foundation shell, essentially. I see. So the Randolph Bourne Foundation is antiwar.com, you know, uh, corporate front, I see. for lack of a better term. From what I learned on the website, um, I guess it's pretty clear Romando, or you guys are all libertarians, and, and Justin Romando is a former rightist, and then you write that you're a former leftist, and now you guys are both kind of the same as libertarians? or, or Well, I mean, Justin and I have both been libertarians for many, many years. Um, I was actually the state director of the California Libertarian Party, in uh, uh, in 1980, and I uh, have been active, you know, in libertarian politics for a long time as of Justin. But he does come out of the right. I mean, he worked for Goldwater, and uh, he was uh, an objectivist and comes from that background. I was active in the anti-war movement during Vietnam. I was in SDS. My mother was in the Communist Party. Um. And, you know, that's essentially where I came out of. So what is it that you two agree on, if those are such opposite points of view, or originally anyway? What brought your divergent points of view together so closely? Well, I, I, the, the thing that brings, you know, leftists and rightists together, uh, opposing the war, is opposition to big government, opposition to government intrusion. I mean, it really is. A lot of leftists don't understand 
that one of the foundational principles of conservatism is opposition to big government, opposition to government intervention in micromanaging anything, people's lives, people's business affairs. But what's happened with the conservative movement from a, a, in, the, in the area of, of social issues is that the Christian conservatives and, uh, and related type conservatives have taken over that branch of conservatism. So now the, the social focus of conservatism is one of trying to outlaw anything that is considered to be any deviant in any way. But in actuality, the foundation of conservatism, you know, Barry Goldwater supported legalization of marijuana. He was pro-choice. Uh, you know, the, the earlier, you know, paleo-conservatives as opposed to neoconservatives were actually very, very libertarian. They also, had, there's a strong anti-intervention history within the conservative movement. Prior to World War II, the leaders of the anti-war movement were a coalition. The America First Coalition was a coalition of leftists and rightists who were opposed to America getting involved in the kind of thing that led up to World War I, that were opposed to America's involvement in internationalist organizations like the League of Nations, and that were opposed to Roosevelt's step that led to the American involvement in World War II. Those were all, you know, there were leftists involved, but there were more rightists involved. This is more an opposition to the growth of government. And the key, But the key issue is, getting back to Randolph Bourne's quote, war is the health of the state. But imperialism and war will grow the size of the state, including the size of the state on a domestic level. And that's why you have a new kind of liberal and a new kind of conservative that really aren't too much different when it comes to foreign affairs. They both accept the expansion of government as a positive thing that needs to be done, and they both accept imperialism abroad. They may differ about what countries to invade or what reasons to invade them. But it's essentially an expansion of, of the paternalistic, statist mindset that is expanding beyond just the, the domestic level, but into the international level, where, where the U.S. government basically has to dictate everything, whether it's what you take into your body or whether it's what some other country does with their own government. I mean, we have never never had as a goal in a war the, remo the simple removal of a regime. That has never happened before. Well, although, then again, there was Panama, and there was Grenada, and there was all the coups in Brazil and Chile, and, <clears throat> and the invasion of South Vietnam, and <laughs> I don't know that it's really all that new, really, is it? It isn't. It isn't new in terms of what our real goal has been, but in terms of what we have put forward as the goal. I mean, Noriega, yes, it was a removal of Noriega, but it actually we were saying that he was a criminal and we were trying to arrest him. It still is different in terms of, the, of what we're trying to put forward. The thing today is that there's a whole group of liberals and conservatives who have basically accepted the fact that we are going to be an empire. And that we, it's a matter of being, that we should intervene in these other countries, that we know best for everyone. And that means now that when we go, when we have a disagreement, say, with Syria, the first thing we do is threaten them. We threaten them with military force. And then we say, well, you can avoid getting bashed over the head if you do these other things. So is it fair to say that antiwar.com is, is sort of an attempt to take the left-wingers and the right-wingers who agree about liberty and group them together on as an opposite side of the spectrum against the right-wingers and the left-wingers who agree about empire? 
in, to some extent, but that, I mean, I hate to even think of it anymore. The left wing, right wing thing is so obsolete that I hate to even talk about it because what it, it doesn't mean anything anymore. When you talk to one person about what a left winger or a right winger means, they may be talking about something completely different than what somebody else is. A lot of people may think, oh, a left winger is some, you know, hippie, uh, pot smoking, uh, abortionist, you know, and somebody else thinks that the right, a right winger is, you know, some uh, fundamentalist warmonger, and it's, it's really not that simple. And there's so much overlap now that we really need to abandon it. We really need to look at it in terms of people who advocate more state power and more government and more military as opposed to people who favor less of it. And that's really, really where where the 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 new paradigm is headed. I mean, it's, it's there, not there left and right. No it's more, up and down. So well, you can call it left and right, but if if you do, then it's still. I mean, it, you have to you have to just. The problem with calling it left and right is it means the wrong thing to so many people. Back to the website itself for a moment here, and I love this discussion. And actually, my question is, uh, I mean, judging by, from what you just said. How come I can only find four or five columns written by you when I uh, search antiwar.com? Well, I'm not really that prolific a writer. I'm more of a – I'm an activist, and that's what I've been for for most of my life. I'm more of a – you know, I'm the person that goes out and and gets things done. And so I, I developed the website and basically feature the people I, – I know a lot of people that are good writers and – and, uh, you know, I, I'm busy picking out the headlines and getting the thing together. Right. Okay, so uh, maybe you, but, can... I, you know, I'll write about once or twice a year. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, hey, the columns that I read by you were pretty good. Uh, the one where uh, that was old from 1999 talking about, well, Oliver North must be a good guy now because he's opposed to the Serbia bombing. I'm, I'm sure you choked on that one already, right? Well, yeah, and also, you know, Jesse Jackson actually came, got a little better on the on Kosovo. But at the time I was writing it, I mean, you could, the, the point I made is still absolutely valid. It's just that people change, and right. so there, you know, there was some change about you know what happened. And and the other thing is that a lot of these people who are interventionists, Oliver North is an interventionist, and he basically was really being more conservative about it because he thought it was not going to succeed. I mean, Henry Kissinger was against it until it started, and then he said, well, we're in it. We have to go in and kick butt. You know, it's the whole support your tr- support our troops thing, which, you know, I'm not against the troops. I, I don't blame the troops for being there, but I certainly don't want to encourage them when they're there to continue to be there and kill people, we should bring them home as quickly as possible. That's the best way to support them. Yesterday, there were two American soldiers shot and killed. For what? I mean, Saddam Hussein is gone. And the people of Iraq are still, they're not happy with us, and they're going to be killing us as long as, they're there, as, long as we're there as an occupying force. No, that's what they call a pocket of resistance, right? Well, that's a quick, pretty big, pretty deep pocket, I'd say. So you being the director of anti-war, maybe you can describe to us uh, who your columnists are, the, your regular columnists that you post on there and what their specialties are. Well, we have a number of people that are, are that write only for us or mostly for us. Justin Romando is, is our main columnist. He writes three times a week and writes on a whole – bunch of subjects. He's basically an expert on uh, on politics. I mean, he's been so involved in it for decades that he really has a good handle for international politics, understanding it and explaining it. Um, he's also quite a, a, a uh, flowery writer, and he tends to get people very, very excited one way or another. We get a lot of very, very uh, loving mail for him and a lot of hate mail, too. <laughs> I can vouch for that myself. He's quite a smart aleck in that column. He is. Uh, he pisses me off sometimes. <laughs> uh, and then um, 
let's see, we have uh, Christopher Montgomery, who is a leader in the Conservative Party in Britain, and he writes about uh, what's going on with the, the foreign policy aspects of British politics. Um, what's the name of that column? Airstrip One. Airstrip One from uh, 1984, I guess. Yes, exactly. And uh, interestingly, that, that column used to be occupied by another columnist who was a leader in the Labor Party. So they, they it kind of switched, but it's still coming at, from an anti-war perspective. Uh, and then uh, once a week we have uh, Alan Bach, who is a well-known libertarian. Uh, he's a senior editor of the Orange County Register and uh, the great writer and, and does most of their uh, foreign policy stuff. Um, we have a new columnist, Matthew Bargainer, and uh, I'm not sure what you would say he's an expert on, except that he he's kind of like Justin, but a little bit different. He's very flowery, and he excites and gets a lot of people <laughs> gets a lot of people thinking. Yeah, a lot of his columns are just pretty much straight satire, right? Yes, yes. He's a he's a real smart Alec. <laughs> uh, we have Nabosha Malik, and he is a uh, an expert on the Balkans. Um, he's Bosnian and has also has spends a lot of time spent a lot of time in Serbia and Kosovo and uh is writing from that perspective. Christopher Montgo uh, Christopher Deliso also writes from the Balkans. He's currently living in Macedonia and uh he does not have a weekly column but he we run him about once a week. It's just that he, he sometimes will run him two or three times in a week and then not for a couple of weeks. And then um, you have an American in China, too, right? Yes. Uh, Sasha Matuzak is our, an American in China, and he writes about uh, Chinese politics and Chinese reaction to uh, worldwide events and American politics. Um, he's very, very interesting. We also have uh, some people that write. Uh, we have Joseph Stromberg, who uh, he basically writes about the anti anti war heritage, and he basically ties in the the anti war movement of today to the older traditions of the anti war movement pre World War II, or even uh, older than that, because there there is a, has been a strong anti war tradition. I mean. I hate to bring, you know, somebody up that's not, that's certainly not somebody that I would point to in later life as being uh, good, is Abraham Lincoln. But in 1948, or 1848, he was the uh, leader of the anti-war forces against the Mexican War when he was in Congress. And so, there, you know, there's an anti-war tradition that really goes way back, and it, it's important to for people involved with the movement today to understand that and to understand it's not just some new thing that was invented by hippies in the 60s. After all this time of antiwar.com being up on the Internet, uh, how much have y'all grown? How many hits per day do you get on average nowadays? Well, um, hits is a kind of a, a number that people throw around, and it doesn't mean anything because, you know, it, it, in, it involves actual little tiny files that necessarily get downloaded. but to, to give you a, an answer that means more, I think, uh, we have uh, a little over 3 million page views a month on our site, and we get over a half a million unique visitors a month. Wow. So uh, that's today. I mean, that's post-Iraq War. I, we, we have grown – well, during the Iraq War, we actually went to a point where – we we are we were about double what we are right now, but today we're still about thirty percent higher than we were at the beginning of the year, say, since the Iraq War. So we you know we we <laughs> the war keep you know each war seems to to push us forward in terms of uh, getting uh, visitors. I mean I remember the first during the Kosovo War. I mean the most visits I had ever had in a week I think was a thousand. Uh, and then 
during the Kosovo War, within three weeks, it went from 1,000 to 50,000 in wow. a single week. And I thought that was just incredible. But, I mean, now 50,000 is a good day for us rather than a week. Still, that's an incredible leap in one week forward, though. Or yes, forward yeah, and, week, and I've so. had, a, I've, on more than one occasion, I've had to quickly change ISPs because they just couldn't handle us. And, it, you know, they don't necessarily know that they can't handle you till you really get into that level. Um, we just had to, during the beginning of the Iraq War, we had to quickly switch because when we started uh, getting 50,000, 60,000 unique visitors a day, it's just the traffic, the, our, they couldn't handle us on a T1 line. We had to move to a T3 with a direct pipe to the Internet. So that, bring, you know, our costs have gone up because of that. But on the other hand, people send us money, so that's good. So for anyone in the audience who's not familiar with Antiwar.com, who's never been there, when you go to the front page of Antiwar, you have all your columnists on the left and right. You have the highlighted columns of the day. And then you usually have, what, about a dozen of the, of the biggest headlines of the day, right? Right. And then we'll have a photograph, uh, you know, and then below that we have, you know, less important stories. So when it comes um, to the headlines you post, what are the criteria for make, that makes the cut? or for what makes the cut on any given day. And also, how many people do you have surfing the Internet 24 hours a day to find all these headlines? Um, I have to say that the answer to the first question, it's, it's, it's me. I mean, I'm making a decision with a little bit of help from other people, but essentially I think, you know, I'm saying, well, these are the top stories or these are the stories that we think are really important to get forward. Sometimes there will be a story, you know, Whereas CNN will, you know, say, you know, the, the rescue of Jessica Lynch was the top story of the day. Well, we don't, not, we don't ignore it. We put it on the page. But we might put on the page that the White House is trying to block uh, uh, the 911 panel from getting, you know, documents to complete their investigation. You know, we'll put that pretty high up, whereas, you know, some other paper might put it on page 62. Um, because we think that these are things which not only are more important, but also because they're being ignored by everyone else, they need to be emphasized by us. So that's what, you know, that there's a lot of different criteria, but that's a couple of them right there. Okay, in terms of getting the stories, we have a lot of volunteers around the world I mean, we, we essentially, a lot of them started out as people who just said, oh, I didn't think you saw this story here, I'm sending you a story. And after they do that a few times, they say, well, look, would you like to, you know, do this on a more systematic basis where you actually, you know, cover certain publications, ones that you're comfortable with that you're already covering, and, you know, we'll assign those to you and give you certain guidelines for submitting the links. So there are about 20 people who send me stuff throughout the day. And so, yes, it is going on 24 hours. I mean, I have a woman in the Netherlands, uh, and she sends me stuff for about six hours a day. You know, and I have uh, somebody else in, in Hong Kong, and he's sending me stuff at different hours. And, and so, yes, it is, in a sense, 24 hours a day because we have people worldwide doing this. Um, we also do have a small staff. We have a staff of, well, three full-timers and a few part-timers. Plus uh, some, you know, we have the columnists and writers who are essentially stringers. So, so it's still really a pretty small operation for as much effect as you guys have. I think so. I mean, I, as I said, I've been involved in politics a long time. I've actually since I was a teenager, and I have never been involved in anything that was as cost effective and as energy effective uh, as this. And it really is has a lot to do with the nature of the Internet. I mean, the Internet provides people who would be out selling newspapers on a street corner an opportunity to reach a much greater audience if they can present it, they have something to present, and they can present it in a way that, that sells. But it really it opens up the chances to a lot of people. I think the Internet has been underestimated in terms of its potential. Which brings up the question, 
what effect do you believe that antiwar.com has had on uh, the current geopolitical situation? Well, I think that we've had a great effect. I think that the, you know, one of the things that we provide is, I mean, you can go out and spend the day and look at, you know, the Russian papers and the British papers and the Chinese papers and all these different papers and essentially get all the information, possibly more, than you would get on antiwar.com, but you'll spend the whole day doing it. And so very few people, unless they're really news junkies, do that. On the other hand, you can go to antiwar.com and get this essentially filtered news from from hundreds and hundreds of different sources in a, in a small in a short period of time and so it enables it, it has enabled a lot more people to get this information and, to, and and it gets out and then the other thing is once it gets out a lot of the establishment media turn around and pick it up and you see that more and more especially with the internet you'll see stories that started out on some obscure little website and then all of a sudden they get some attention and they you know you start seeing it in you know the L.A. Times and on CNN and that sort of thing. So and you're sort of forcing them to not be able to ignore these stories, kind of. Exactly, exactly. And you see, you see the response because terminology that we start introducing starts appearing, you know, the pundits start using it. You know, I, there are pundits out there who I know because you can tell in their response that they're reading antiwar.com every day. Chris Matthews reads antiwar.com every day on positive based on the kinds of things that he brings up when he's talking to his guests. Excellent. And so, you know, it has an effect in that way. I mean, the, you know, the term the war party was kind of a lost term. It, it was it was invented by uh, Robert La Follette in the, in the 20s after uh, World War One, And uh, we revived it, and now you see all kinds of people using it. Uh, the neoconservative label is essentially one that was, was coined by Justin Romando several years ago. Oh, really? Because I thought they tried to call themselves that. They, they were the neo-Reaganites, and then they called themselves the neoconservatives. Did that no. that really came from Mr. Romando? As far as I know, I mean, I, I may be wrong, but my understanding is that, that, that the first place that appeared in print was in his book that came out reclaiming the American right in the 80s. Well, if that's the case, then you guys have had a tremendous effect because everywhere in the media now is stories about the split, so-called at least, between the neoconservatives and the rest of the political class up there in Washington. Well, and, and whether or not, the, regardless of where the term came from, we've had a lot to do with advancing that information out into the to the general media, where it just you know you see these cycles, you see it cycle on up from a certain place and it, you know you'll see a story that that one day it's on you know uh information uh information uh what's it called it's a little website that he come up with oh. some stuff that's really amazing um you know you see it on there and then a couple of days later you'll see it in some uh on some other blog or some other website that's a little bit bigger and then we'll run it or something and then you know a week later you'll see it hit Associated Press, and all of a sudden, it's it's a real story. Well, since you guys are, are such a single-issue kind of website, it's very rare. Occasionally, I'll see headlines posted about uh, laws passed about our individual liberty uh, here at home and that kind of thing, which led me to wonder if you've ever considered creating maybe a separate website, antipolicestate.com, where you could be kind of a single-issue focusing on federal police power. Well, I would be totally in favor of it. It would be great, but I can only do so much. <laughs> you know, it's it's just a question of the amount of things. I mean, there are you need so a many clone. things. Yeah, there's so many things with AnyWar.com that I would like to to expand and have plans to expand, but we just don't have the time to do it. And so, you know, I would hope that libertarians and other freedom uh, lovers would see AnyWar.com would use it as a model for creating these things in, in other areas. I mean, we do deal with the police state aspect a little bit, especially if, if in regards to the Internet and civil liberties regarding political rights. 
I mean, we see that as really essential to focus on because they are very, very threatened by the U.S. foreign policy. The U.S. foreign policy, the, the, the justification for what we're doing in foreign policy is being used as a justification for these other repressive domestic policies. And so we do run articles that try to point that out. Yeah, and it's been uh, made clear on this show by various guests recently that uh, war abroad and individual liberty at home are explicitly tied together and that you can't be involved in a foreign war without sacrificing liberty here at home. Right, and, 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 and even the people who believe in liberty but, but go ahead and sacrifice it understand that. I mean, William F. Buckley, when, at the beginning of the Cold War, William F. Buckley uh, it said that, and, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he said that, that we would temporarily have to give up certain liberties in order to fight communism. And when the Soviet Union fell, many conservatives, people like Pat Buchanan and Robert Novak, who bought into this, also bought into, they remembered the pledge and they said, well, this is gone now. We should start looking at regaining some of the freedoms that we lost, not in getting rid of some of them. Are there any affiliated groups that anti-war dot com is involved with uh, that people could look into as well. Well, um, we are we are we have become more and more affiliated with a group called the Independent Institute in Oakland. Uh, it's a libertarian think tank, and they have uh, they used to be primarily focused on economic and and government reform type issues. After nine one one, they really saw the importance of focusing on foreign policy and and uh, and totalitarianism, and so that has been more of their focus, and as a result, we have been working very more and more closely every day with them. Uh, we have uh, today's spotlight on the on the site is written by Ivan Eland, who used to be with the Cato Institute, and now he runs the, the Independent Institute's Center for Peace and Liberty. And uh, you know, we're really proud. While well, we've seen you know some some people, some libertarians turn kind of away from opposing war in in a response to 911 they've done quite the opposite and have been very heroic we ha we are having a tremendous effect not just in terms of of changing foreign policy but we've had a, a great effect i think in terms of shaping the new anti-war movement and any war leaders and activists are now seeing that they need to uh, reach out to the mainstream, and the, one of the ways that they can do that is with the rhetoric that we provide, because we're not communists. I mean, we're not... Uh, <laughs> we're not... I'm um, sorry, I just know the whole audience cringes. Oh, no, did he just call me a communist? No, I mean, we <laughs> run communists. We, we have communists that write, you know, and that we run their articles. We want a broad-based coalition, but we see... The way to reach out to the, to the mainstream of the American public is by pointing out that anti-war sentiment is, in fact, American. It is patriotic. It is founded in the American values, and that that's the thing that's going to sell the majority on opposing wars, not trying to convince them that, you know, this is a war for oil. Well, if it's not, whether it's for oil or not, does that mean killing people? You know, for is right. I mean, when if it was not for oil or if it's for oil, what does it matter? You know, when they say no war without the United Nations approval, well, the United Nations could have just as easily approved this war, just just like they've done with other wars. But and, and that wouldn't make it okay for Putin and Chirac it, it, to agree. No, it makes it worse. As far as I'm concerned, if the UN had approved the war, it would have been worse because it would have been more of a. Uh, more of an it would have said that more of the world said that this war was okay. I mean, I was glad to see, you know, France for whatever reason oppose the war because, you know, if the UN had 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 endorsed it from the beginning, it would be much much easier to promote 
this sort of thing in the future. It would be much easier for them to just go, well, now we've got to go here, now we've got to go here, now we go to here. And well, so, do you think that the anti-war left has made it easier that next time, as long as the U.N. approves, it'll be okay for them to do whatever they want? Well, that's the problem. That's, you know, if you set up these sort of things, you say, well, if the inspectors signed X, Y, Z, then you can go to war. Well, you know, they might find it. You know, or whether it's there or not, they might find it. I mean, they, they can just as easily invent this. And then it gets into the whole issue, you know, what right did, did they, did the UN or the U.S. have in the first place of setting up these sanctions and the no-fly zones and these restrictions on on the Iraqi government as to what kind of weapons they could have when they had the same kind of weapons as their neighbors? I mean, we the reason that they had these biological agents is because we gave it to them in the 70s and the 80s to fight against Iran. You know, and... We need to we need to stop supporting tyrants, not change which tyrants we're supporting, because they always come back to haunt us. They always turn out bad. When do we support tyrants that they turn out to be good? I can't think of any. Well, how do you they respond? Turn out bad. How do you respond to say I don't know the average writer for Newsweek or something who says, "Oh, well, you're just a." backwards-looking, shadow-cowering isolationist. I'm not an isolationist. I, I actually consider myself an internationalist, although I don't identify with what a lot of the, you know, the, the, global, the, the, the globalists advocate. I advocate free trade. I advocate, you know, opening borders. I am not an isolationist. I think that we have to realize that we live in a world and I support things like the common market, but I don't support things like the EU, because that's, that's a totally different thing. The common market says, let's take down boundaries and not charge each other for, for trading and not build up hostility, where the EU says, you can't sell uh, this kind of mushroom in, this kind, in, in anywhere in, the, in Europe if you call it this, because... That's offensive to somebody in Belgium, you know. <laughs> it goes for the lowest common denominator. That's ridiculous. You know, the, the, the internationalist urge should be one of peace and of ending restrictions and borders rather than on, you know, changing borders and building up new ones. Well, but wasn't the common the market done. wasn't the common market just the, the first step toward the European Union? Uh, well, for certain people it was, but it didn't it certainly didn't have to be. Um, you know, the, the, the internationalists have always pushed certain things, and and that doesn't mean that every one of their ideas as a component is a bad thing. For example, free trade is a good thing, but really the internationalists are not for free, free trade because when you look at things like the World Trade Organization and NAFTA, these are not free trade. You know, it's not free trade when you say, you know, the, the U.S. has to accept less qualified nurses from Mexico because otherwise it defends Mexico. That's not free trade. Free trade is saying, you know, I can buy your goods. We're not going to stop the people of a country from getting goods. And the opposite of free trade, sanctions and tariffs and trade restrictions and stuff, these are the things that lead to war. I mean, what we're doing to Syria right now, we are, we are doing this carrot and the stick thing with Syria, and the stick is that we have cut off their oil supply. They got most of their oil from Iraq, and we have shut the pipeline down. We said, you cannot get oil from Iraq anymore. So what are they going to do? Exactly. What they are going to do is they're, you know, it. What I think they're going to do, I think that they're going to give in. They're going to do some of the things that the U.S. wants them to do, and they already are. The, when, uh, Mrs. Anthrax, who was captured a couple of days ago, was essentially handed over by the Syrian government. And they're going to be doing more and more things. A lot of countries are going to give in, which is going to embolden the war party, but it doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah, 
with the fact that we won the war, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, we won the war and there weren't that many you know, innocent people killed as, you know, a proof that the war was a good thing. And that's kind of like saying that, you know, you, you know, it was really easy to beat up this guy, so that proves that it was, you know, that I should have beaten him up. That makes no sense. Well, and the plan is to use our new position in Iraq to put pressure on Syria and Iran and the rest of the countries in the area, too. Isn't that right? Well, yes, and it, it puts us in a in a very good position. It enables us to pull out of the countries that we may even decide to invade later, like Saudi Arabia, and have a real base in a country that, that is essentially a colony of ours, Iraq, and use that as a military base to not necessarily to strike every country in the Middle East, but to threaten every country in the Middle East. And now we're looking at, at countries that were never a threat to the United States on the basis that to Israel. Which isn't quite good enough, is it? No. I mean, it's it's like Israel has this, spe this special relationship. And there have been other countries that had similar special relationships, but probably not one as, as intense as, as with Israel. I mean... We do, the United States government does a lot of things on behalf of Israel that we would never do on behalf of any other country. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. It, it, it's basically that there's a lot of people with different reasons that have coalesced into uh, an Israeli lobby in the United States that's really very, very powerful. I'm Jewish. I, I think it's absolutely horrible what this lobby has done to associate the policies of an oppressive nation with a religion that has nothing to do with that. So who are, who's in this coalition of all these different divergent interests? Well, a lot of the leadership of it are Christians, are fundamentalist Christians who believe that uh, the expansion of Israel is some sort of biblical uh, prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. And so therefore and that, it must be the, the policy of America. Thing. Yeah, that's the absolute scariest thing. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of these fundamentalists. So you um, have a bunch of born again Christians who are more Zionist than the Zionists. Absolutely, because it's kind of interesting because during the last month or so, the Israeli lobby, the Jewish part of the Israeli lobby has been pretty quiet on this roadmap. Because they don't want, they think that it, you know, that they're, that it could backfire if they start opposing it. Fundamentalist Christians, on the other hand, have been out there, you know, trying to stop it. Um, and oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> That's all right. Something about how, oh, I'm sure it was something about how the fact that their belief in their religion is the motivation for their foreign policy. Uh, I think you were saying when I interrupted you before about that that's the scariest part about it is that they believe they're doing God's work and that sort of thing. Right. And then the other thing is that they, there are people that support Israel because they support a, uh, a democratic socialist type government. And they think that that's the best type of government to support worldwide. And so Israel is the government you know, to favor in that region. And, you know, the, the what I would call kind of the neoliberals, the neocon left, that who support Israel, I think that's that's really the the reasoning for it. Because there you have it's a socialist government and even the Likud Party, which is considered conservative as opposed to the Labour Party, which is explicitly socialist, is socialist. I mean they, everything is socialized and because of the, the American government giving them ten plus billion dollars a year, they are able to have some very very nice services while still providing some of the best security and armed forces in the world. Well, what do you say to the argument that if America stopped supporting Israel, that it would be doomed? Well, I, if America stopped supporting Israel, their democratic socialist system would be doomed. They might have to shift some of the. Uh, expenses of having the, you know, biggest welfare system and the uh, most expensive educational and health systems in the world, they might have to cut back 
on some of those and pay, you know, in order to pay for the security. On the other hand, they could certainly save a lot of money on security if they weren't constantly aggressing against other people. Do you think that they're going to try to push the Palestinians out of the West Bank and wholly into Jordan or something? That seems to be the plan. I mean, whether I think that whether or not they do it is still dependent on a lot of things, and so I hope not. But I think that that clearly is the plan. And if you look at, like, uh, the visit the other day uh, to the United States, uh, he may still be here, uh, Benny Ellen, uh, the, the Israeli tourism minister, he represents – it's kind of an interesting thing because he came here as essentially a representative of the Israeli government. But before he left Israel, he denounced Sharon and Sharon denounced him, and not in a, and not in a friendly way uh, because he has essentially said – but Sharon's own plan for the roadmap is much too pro-Palestinian and, and needs to be torpedoed. So Sharon and is the dove now. Well, that's that's how they, they you know by changing it to, to to mean that it makes it a lot easier. You know, by presenting this guy by sending this guy to the United States, Sharon can then come in and say, "Oh no, we're not going to do." you know, what he advocated, which is, in fact, he does advocate that openly, he advocates Jordan is Palestine and we should send all the Palestinians to Jordan and let let them, let it be Palestine. And, and to me, as a libertarian, the way that these arguments are posed is really offensive because it's posed on an ethnic and religious and nationality level, and these are people. You know, and the fact that they had a house and land that they that they owned in Palestine, and now they're being told because there are people that also call themselves Palestinians living in Jordan that they have to be pushed into Jordan, that is a total uh, abandonment of the idea of property rights. And I think that property rights is really an issue that needs that, that can solve a lot of these problems. Because the issue in in Israel is not really an issue of religion and I mean it, 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 all this flavors it, but the real issue is property rights, and the Palestinians are being are ha are are having things stolen from them, and it doesn't make any difference if they're Palestinians or Arabs or whatever, they're individuals and they're having their property stolen, and that's where they're being wronged. And that's why it's very, very difficult for people who are pro-Israel to deal with this situation unless they start posing it in religious or ethnic terms. Because it's a lot easier to get away with doing something to a group than to an individual. Right. I mean, you know, they say, well, you know, the Palestinians were, were given, you know, this, that, and the other thing for the fact that they had all their land taken. Well, I doubt it was the same Palestinians. You know, you're not talking about the people who were were harmed having any sort of restitution. You're talking about people who have the same ethnic background getting something. But that's that's not fair. That's crap. Okay, let's talk about North Korea. What's going on over there this week? Well, of course, I know less about North Korea as probably a lot of us do. Um, but uh, I think, in, I mean, North Korea is essentially a situation, again, see, we've created all of these situations where you have these nations that are that are essentially have blockaded themselves in the past and into these warlike nations. And the main reason that they're using to continue is the threat by us. I mean, you know, a better example, because I know a little bit more about it, is Cuba. You know, if we got rid of the sanctions against Cuba, if Americans started visiting Cuba, if we started trading with them, I think Castro would be overthrown in a very short time. And it's clearly the U.S. that has kept Castro in power for many, many, many years. To some extent, that is also true in Korea. I mean, I really think that if, you know, if, you, if we hadn't had the Korean War, the communism in Korea would have run its course and would have fallen, certainly, 
by the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. But we are we are keep by isolating North Korea. We are continuing their move toward desperate actions. And that is one of the scariest places on earth. And we could very, very easily start things, start a progression of events that could lead to a nuclear explosion. And they now have missiles that can reach North America, correct? Well, we don't really know that. I mean, we don't really know that they have a nuclear bomb. We don't really know that they have missiles that could reach North America, although the latter is more confirmed. They may not, in fact, have a deliverable nuclear weapon right now. And we could stop them. We could stop them right now. How? Pull all the troops out of Korea, give them some aid, pay them a bribe. I know that's not the libertarian answer, but that is the cheapest answer. Pay them a bribe and try and get free trade in there as quickly as possible, because once you open up the borders, you know, what they really, I've heard the neocons talk about this. The neocons are not as afraid of North Korea having a nuclear bomb as they are afraid of the United Korea having a nuclear bomb. They do not want South and North Korea to unite because it would become a major player. And, you know, what would happen in terms of the government would be, to a large extent, I mean, South Korea is three times the population of North Korea. Essentially, you know, there would be some chaos, just like there was when Germany united, but you'd have a situation where the, the country would become homogeneous in a very short period of time, at which point it would it would become one of the most well-armed nations on Earth, and that scares a lot of the, the neocons. But the fact is, it would be a peace. It would be a more peaceful nation. Would you have a case? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. And that's, that would be a good thing. When you advocate pulling the troops back, I wonder what do you think when you hear Donald Rumsfeld proposing pulling the troops back? Well, Rumsfeld's motivation for pulling the troops back are different. Donald Rumsfeld wants to pull the troops back in preparation for a possible war. I mean, he does not want to pull them back as a preparation for moves toward peace. And, and you know, essentially pulling them from from the border, you know, could be seen that way depending on what other actions were taken at the same time. And as I said, what I'm advocating is that you take the actions uh, at the same time of giving them some aid, of opening up trade as quickly as possible, and then that would not be seen in the same light. And, you know, Rumsfeld, you know, Rumsfeld is a tinker, and I don't know that he actually believes that he's going to pull troops back. He likes to, to field a lot of these things to see what people will say and to see what kind of uh, uh, alternatives it's going to generate. So I'm not sure he ever seriously proposed that. All right, well, our hour is almost up here, uh, unless you want to stay on. Uh, let's a few see. more minutes anyway. Okay, yeah, i got a, a couple more questions for you at least. Um, I think this one is probably pretty important to a lot of people, uh, or should be at least in my view. I want to ask you if the hatred of the people of the world for our government, uh, does it seem to be becoming more directed toward the regular American people in general nowadays, or is it still just our state that they hate so much? Uh, you know, I don't know. Because I think that most people still understand that, that it's the government. But, you know, after a while, the it becomes harder and harder to blur the difference. You know, the, the, the difference becomes blurred. And uh, I think that the more that this sort of feeling persists, the more it is going to translate into just the hatred of Americans, because it's hard to separate it. And, you know, it becomes more and more ingrained as it's, as, instead of it just being a, a month-long outburst, if it's a thing that just keeps on coming, then eventually that's, it's going to turn into racism. 
yeah, it seems possible that in a few decades we could end up having the whole world allied against us at the rate we're going now. We could, although a lot of them will be allied with us because we will have threatened them and bought them off. And, you know, that's what we're doing right now with a lot of countries, with Eastern Europe. I mean, one of the, the reason that we're having, you know, Polish and, and uh, Romanian and Bulgarian troops go into Iraq uh, is not just because we're trying to make it look like it's multinational, although, you know, it's certainly helpful. But the reasons are that we're trying to gain more of, an, of a military and control foothold in those countries. And also, they work for a lot less. It's a lot cheaper to pay for a Romanian soldier patrolling Iraq than it is to pay for an American soldier to patrol Iraq. The race to the bottom. Yep. So, uh, speaking of Romania and Poland and all that, uh, I guess... The, the short answer would be easier, but maybe you got a long one about your view of NATO expansion and what that means in this era. Well, the the NATO, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things involved with NATO. NATO is an obsolete organization. It was formed to protect Eastern Europe or protect Western Europe from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, and NATO almost dissolved in the early 90s, and it should have, um, from, you know, from anybody's point of view. Now, NATO is being looked at as something that can be used for a different purpose than to protect Europe. You know, you have NATO troops in Afghanistan, which is not really near Europe, and certainly is not protecting the North Atlantic. Uh, you know, you have NATO troops talking about going to North Africa. You know, you have uh, NATO being used as another multinational body when the when the United States can't get the UN, they can use NATO. Which is what in we did in Serbia, that, right? What? Which is what we did in Serbia, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's a, it's a lot easier if we have a variety of these organizations we can choose from to enforce. Uh, the different things we want to enforce, it gives us a variety of uh, ways to do it. In addition, NATO is now being used as a counterweight against the EU. And as bad as the EU is, it is being perceived as a threat to America, which would almost make it a good thing. But <laughs> it's, it's a threat in that it's, it's a threat not in terms of they're going to invade us or anything, but it's a threat to power, the U.S. power in Europe. So we're and trying to make sure that the European military continues to be integrated with ours and doesn't create its own central military. Exactly. And so us. there's a big fight right now between some countries that want to go ahead and create a new EU force that's totally independent, totally dynamic, and one that wants to basically make it subservient to NATO. Are all the former Soviet republics now part of NATO? I, you know, I don't know. I, I certainly close to it. Now they just they just uh, brought seven new countries into it, and I I think most, if not all of them, are. Well, and Russia has now joined NATO as a somewhat limited partner, at least, right? Well, you know, they're part of a couple of the NATO subsidiary organizations, but. Uh, I would be very surprised if Russia ever actually became a member of NATO. Well, that's encouraging, at least. I'm glad to hear you say that. I think but anything is possible. There's something scary about the idea of the entire North allied versus whoever's left in the South. Well, they'll have that, too. It, you know, a lot of people forget that there was an organization called CETO, which uh, was used as the justification for Vietnam, uh, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. It was a, a NATO uh, clone that was used there and, and uh, was our legal excuse for going into Vietnam. Does it still exist? No. It fell apart after, the, after Vietnam or after the Soviet Union fell? Uh, I think after Vietnam. Very interesting. Well, you guys there ever... was even a CENTO at one time, 
which was uh, Middle East. And the headquarters of Cento, I believe, was in Baghdad back when they were an American ally. Oh, I've never heard of that before. Uh, were there any wars fought under the banner? I don't believe so. Hey, do you guys uh, antiwar.com ever post anything from The Onion? We do. Um, you know, we're really careful because we get a lot of negative stuff when we run satire, uh, and we have to clearly identify it as satire because we've gotten some really nasty series of letters from running certain things. But uh, we do from time to time. Because it's I love, nice when I you, love The Onion. It's nice when you've been reading antiwar.com for a couple of hours and, uh, you know, you're – bottom lip is hanging so low you're about to trip over it and then uh, to get a nice laugh every once in a while. It's a good know. balance. Definitely a good balance and they have some very good foreign policy analysis. <laughs> What's going on at the UN this week? Uh, are they taking part in the rebuilding? Is that still being debated? Or? It sounds like they're going to basically give in to whatever the U.S. wants. And, and here is another interesting thing because the U.S. is now advocating getting rid of Iraq sanctions. Uh, and some other countries that were anti-war want to keep the sanction. And I even read an article in an anti-war publication this morning by an anti-war leader advocating keeping the sanction. To stop Halliburton from making money? Is yes. that why? Yes. Because it just shows what their motivation is, that their motivation is more to promote their economic program than to than caring for the, the fate of the Iraqi people. Because the, the arguments that the U.S. has been using over the last couple of weeks for getting rid of the sanctions held as much water two months ago as they do today. You know, the fact that Iraq, it's unfair to not let Iraqi Americans send up to $500 to their relatives in Iraq. You know, the fact that they can't, that they have to import gasoline, you know, that they can't uh, get all of these different things that they need is the argument that the U.S. has been using. Well, that was also true beforehand. And we're not talking about weapon systems. We're talking about water purification and, and things that are necessary to live. And, of course, we should get rid of the sanctions. And the fact that the U.S. is supporting that, so what? We should get rid of all sanctions everywhere. People should be allowed to freely trade between one another. The government should not use restraint of trade as a, as a way of, of wielding foreign policy. Well, and what about, you just brought up West, weapon systems. What about that? What about uh, the power of a government, for example, to for our government to make it illegal for an Iraqi American to mail some AK-47s over there or something like that. Uh, well, or for an American corporation to sell Iraq a bunch of new tanks. or We pick and choose. For example, if, if, if it was discovered that you had sent money to the Iraqi army, you would be prosecuted. On the other hand, if you sent money to the Israeli army, you can get a U.S. tax credit. Did you know that? You can write that off on your taxes. You can. There's a foundation that essentially supports auxiliary activities of the IDF. It's an official government agency in Israel, and it is registered as a foundation in the United States. You can give it money and write it off your taxes. Yeah, well, I got something to say to that, and that is that people can donate to antiwar.com and write that off on their taxes, too. That's right. They can. <laughs> but that's the, the thing is, it... it, it it's all pick and choose. You know, who, who are you going to let send, you know, for many, many years, the U.S. government turned a blind eye to people who sent guns to Northern Ireland. And for many, many years, they, sent a, they turned a blind eye to people who sent arms to Israel before, or to the, to the freedom fighters in Palestine before there was an Israel. But it's all a matter of what's, what's allowed. And it's very similar to the whole idea of what's prohibit what's not prohibited is compulsory and vice versa. And a, an individual in Iraq prior to the fall of Saddam could own a firearm, could own a personal firearm, and the US has started taking away their guns. 
<laughs> we've instituted gun control in, in Iraq. I thought we were liberating them. That's one of the ways that we're liberating them is by giving them Western ideas like gun control. Yes, that is a very American principle. Isn't that the Second Amendment yes. that all guns should be illegal? Yeah, I think that's what it says. Oh, oh I, I, sometimes I get my antonyms mixed up. <laughs> I apologize. So is there any big headlines this week that you think ought to be brought to people's attention that they could look up on antiwar.com? Well, one thing that you can always find on antiwar.com is we're, we're updating the page a few hours. So you can usually find the, the most up-to-date information about what's going on uh, throughout the day. Um, but what's going on right now, you know, is – more of the same in terms of Iraq nation building. We're trying to dictate to the Iraqi people what kind of government they can have, and and it's about to blow up in their in our faces. You know, there's a lot of different aspects to that. And we talk a lot about building a democracy there. I wonder if they had a democracy, wouldn't they immediately install an ayatollah and declare a holy war against the great Satan? Yeah, well, that's the whole problem with 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 promoting democracy at the point of a gun. You know, you can't really uh, do that because if you let people vote, then then you probably are not going to get what you want if your idea is to control them. I mean, w the United States canceled the elections in Vietnam because in the 60s because we did not want Ho Chi Minh to get elected. And we certainly are not going to allow people to run who are not allowed to, who are not, you know, on the approved list to run for these kinds of offices. But we're talking about years away before we allow, have any sort of elections anyway. I mean, we had our first election for a little city council, a trial, Mosul, and most of the people who wanted to run weren't allowed to run. And most of the people being chosen to rule haven't lived in Iraq for decades. Mr. Chalabi, who is being promoted by the Israel faction as the, the likely new president of Iraq, left Iraq in 1958. 58. 45 years ago. And now he's going to be the new administrator, presumably. That's right. And and essentially what they've done in most of Iraq at this point is they've, in some cities they've installed Saddam's former bureaucrats, and in the other ones they're installing all these exiles who haven't been in the country for decades. And in both cases, the, 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 uh, the natives are not really happy about that. I can't imagine how bad it would have to be for the American people to embrace a foreign invader to come and liberate us from our own government. Well, I think that, see, you know, you look at a movie like Red Dawn, which was not an anti-war movie. You know, I don't know if you remember that from the 80s. Very well. It was, you know, that was about you know, the Russians invading the United States. And everybody became either imprisoned or a terrorist. They all turned into terrorists, and the heroes in that movie were the pro-U.S. terrorists. And, of course, you're going to have that sort of thing. And one of the things, you know, really pissed me off during the, the coverage of the war was I saw some of these embedded reporters talking about how the they were advancing, you know, the tanks were advancing, and terrorists came out of the rocks and started firing at them. They're, they're calling the people defending their homes terrorists. That's a pretty loose definition. It gets to be where anyone opposed to what the American war machine is doing is right. a terrorist. Well, you're either How long or... before Eric Garris is a terrorist for running antiwar.com? You're either with us or you're against us. That's, that's the whole thing. What, what do you think would happen if... Um, I, I suppose you remember at the beginning of the war they moved our terrorist alert level up from orange or from yellow to orange. What do you think would be the case if there was another attack or short of that for whatever reason they raised the level from orange to red? Well, they've already talked about that. That, that essentially means martial law that they would send 
uh, as many civil liberties as they felt needed to be suspended at that time, that they would uh, start implementing curfews in cities, uh, that they would basically, uh, it would become an un, unabashed police state. Do you think if we go to Code Red, we could ever come back down again? I hope. You know, it's it's really hard to regain lost freedom for a lot of reasons. And, you know, a lot of it's people's memories. You know, a lot of people, one of the unfortunate things today is that a lot of young people support the war, uh, supported this war and will support other wars because they have been presented for a lot of their adult life with these new arguments for war that have nothing to do with the defense of the nation or, or, or that sort of thing, that are now talking about, well, if you see somebody beating up somebody else, you got to go send in a thousand people and kill as many people as possible till you fix it. And that that's the proper way to, to behave. And so that's one of the attitudes that we need to really fight. The other problem is that a lot of people, the young people, didn't live through Vietnam, and they didn't live through Watergate, and they trust our government too much. They trust what they say, and that's a real scary thing. When I was in fourth or fifth grade, I guess it was, the state legislature of Texas made it, uh, it was already a law, I guess, that they had to teach what's so good about America as opposed to what's so bad about the Soviet Union, and why in America you're free and the government leaves you alone unless you do something wrong, whereas in Russia, you got to ask them for permission for everything first, and they decide everything for you first, and they right. invade without asking or being attacked, and that the reason America is so much better is because here the individual is what's important, not the group. And I wonder, now that there's no Soviet Union and there's no why we're better than the Soviet Union class, I wonder if these children going to government school these days are ever exposed to the ideas of what made America different than all these other nations in history. I hope, I don't know, I hope so. You know, one of the things that I get is a lot of hate mail, especially at the height of the war. And I got a lot of mail from people who seem to believe that the appropriate way to respond during a war is to take on the domestic policies of the country that we're at war with. In other words, you wouldn't be free to do this in Iraq, so you shouldn't be free to do it here either. That's really smart. Well, it's essentially what many, 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 probably thousands of people over the course of the war told me in so many words. That if they had the power, they would shut me down because I should not be allowed to oppose the war because in Iraq, I wouldn't be allowed to oppose the war. Those are all got to be government school graduates there. Well, I'm not sure about the graduate part. I'm yeah, pretty well. sure about the government school part. Yeah. And isn't it a funny euphemism, public schools, as opposed to just calling them what they are, government schools? See, how about freeway? I always thought they should call those taxways. You can do an endless George Carlin bit about all the euphemisms and the way yes. that language is manipulated in order to influence our opinions. Sure. All right. Well, I don't really know what else to ask you. You got anything well, very important you want to tell us? Well, i got to get back to work anyway. So uh, just come to anywhere.com and check us out. Remember that uh, we change our front page completely every day and add new stories throughout the day. Uh, you can also, if you miss us today, you can click on uh, the last seven days and look at the last seven days of our front pages, and we archive all the other materials as well. So uh, there's a lot of stuff on the site, and uh, if you have any interest in uh, issues of war and peace and freedom and liberty and in foreign affairs in general, uh, even if you're pro-war, we have a lot of people that are pro-war that like to go to our site because we have such a resource of information. And I will say from my own view that antiwar.com is literally indispensable for people who want to stay up to date on what's going on in foreign affairs these days.
absolutely indispensable. And I'd like to say to you, Mr. Garris, please never stop, at least until Ron Paul is the Speaker of the House. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming on. All right, take it easy. All right.